Hello, Monetization Nation. I'm Nathan Gwilym, your host. Today, I'm joined by John Weberg. John is an American entrepreneur, a top 1% consultant and super affiliate. By age 23, he was a two-time self-published author and had helped clients in industries such as SaaS, e-commerce, coaching, and more. John currently spends his time helping entrepreneurs scale their businesses profitably without outside capital. In today's episode, we're going to discuss how we can instantly increase our ROI or return on investment. We're going to cover the following key takeaways. Number one, there are many different ways entrepreneurs can fund their businesses themselves. We don't have to use outside capital. Number two, to increase our ROI instantly, we may be able to raise our prices. Number three, the certainty of getting the result that the product will deliver and the reduction of risk increases our value. Number four, we should follow up with our customers as this helps to build and maintain our relationships. And number five, split testing helps us determine what works so we don't waste time and money on things that don't. Thank you so much for joining us here on the show, John. Absolutely. Thank you as well. I'm glad uh, we could finally get a date together and look forward to providing as much value and helping people as as much as I possibly can. And today we're going to talk about how to instantly increase ROI without spending more. It's taken many years to to realize and get to where I'm at, um, but it's something that can be done if, if done right. There's a few things, especially recently I've learned that I think will help people a lot. Will you start off by sharing with us something that you are super passionate about? Two things. One, gaming. Ever since uh, I was a little kid, teenager, it's something my brothers, my family have always done. Uh, Just to pass the time, creativity. Um, I've always loved that. And that's actually the direction I was going to go. If I didn't go into business, I was going to go into game creation and stuff because I'm pretty creative. Nice. Um, So love games, just to have fun, talk to people. Um, And then business-wise... Something that I'm more getting into even more that I've done naturally and haven't really practiced until the past couple of months is actually sales. Sales, because I think I think sales is used in the rest of marketing, in the rest of business, and people just don't realize that, whether it's your ads, whether it's follow-up, you're kind of following a sales structure without realizing it. So I've gotten more into sales. I was more before, more into the marketing side. I'm getting more now into sales and how to charge more and how to raise prices and a bunch of really cool stuff. What is your favorite sales strategy? Number one, this is something I learned uh, recently. Um, Basically what it does, you know, kind of the the title of what we're kind of going through is how to increase revenue instantly. So this works especially well for agencies, coaches, consultants, anyone's usually doing higher ticket. This usually works really well for. It's basically how to raise your price and how to raise your price really effectively. So basically every time you get a new customer, you're making more money. So what you do is basically in any sales conversation, whether it's say uh, for consulting, I provide or coaching you provide, or, you know, any SaaS company or an agency that's providing, um, we do Facebook ads, for example, not me personally, but an example, someone does Facebook ads for a client um, and say, you know, they're going through the sales pitch and what they're offering. The person asks how much it costs or, Someone asks you how much it costs or you get to that point where you're going to tell them you actually structure your price above what you normally charge. One, because the the person says, yes, that sounds good. We can afford that. Great. You just raise your prices and instantly got a higher paying client versus all the other clients. So instantly one, what people need to do is start charging more and start at a higher price than what your product service actually charges for. So say, for example, um, some agencies charge $3,000 a month. Some agencies charge $5,000 a month. Say I charge $3,000. I'm going to say, hey, to the client, I charge $5,000 a month. And then what you do is, if the client is hemming and hawing, you know, they have any price discrepancies, they're kind of changing their attitude, their tone. They're not as much, as interested as they were before you said the price, which is usually the case. They go, oh, the price? They co- this costs money? Um, then that allows you to actually work down to your original price. So... A, option A, the client says, yes, they love it. You raised your prices, which people should be doing naturally as you retain and keep more clients. You need to raise your prices as you become more valuable in the services you offer. But also B, if you debate, you want to give this person a deal, you really like what their business structure is, you think you can really get them results, you're able to work down 
still to a profitable number or to your original normal price anyways. So say it's 3,000, you suggest 5,000, you walk, walk through and talk with the, the prospect and you get down to 4,000. You're still raising your prices, still providing the same service, and now you just raise your ROI per client. If you do that, you know, an agency does that 10 times, that's, that's quite a bit more money overnight. Yeah, that is such a common problem that entrepreneurs have that they undervalue what they do and they undercharge. And then it causes a myriad of other issues like you can't provide as good of a service or you can't hire as good of a team or, you know, it, you can actually provide a better service often when you charge, you know, a higher and fairer price. Why do you think we should not try to use outside capital? Two main reasons for that that I try to stay away from as much as possible. The first reason, of course, is not being dependent on outside funding, outside sources, being able to be self-sufficient. So in my own business, uh, and I suggest this for other companies, other entrepreneurs, other affiliates, um, you don't want a portion of your profits taken away. You don't want to owe someone in debt wise as much as possible. Um, you can use debt wisely in some situations, but too much, you're going to have to take care of that in the long run. Um, but also it's mainly being self-sufficient, both in how proud you are in, in that you were able to accomplish what you were in your business and how fulfilled you will be that you did it on your own or, you know, with your own resources. I think that's huge. Um, and just the start of dependency on someone else for capital, um, for resources just isn't something that I'm interested in. I think that it takes away from what you can develop and develop for yourself or develop for your own business along the lines, you know, over time anyways. So I think that's huge. Um, and I think that you don't want to do it with outside capital as well, because there are so many different ways people can do it themselves, whether it's a startup, whether it's already a developed agency or developed business, there are so many different things you can do. Like we just went through, for example, on how to raise prices, any consultancy agency, uh, a coach consultant that's looking to say, for example, they just need, they just need, uh, you know, a large influx of cash. If they learn how to, let's just say they get 10 clients a month or 20 clients a month on average, and they want to, I need a large influx of capital. We're looking to expand, we're looking to scale. How can we do that? If they simply learn how to just one tweak of increasing the prices per client by a thousand dollars to $2,000 a month by 10 people, that's $20,000 a month extra in revenue, you know, and you, there's other changes and things I think you can do without upside capital that are much more time efficient, that are much more uh, energy efficient, and that won't cost you anything that you can just implement in strategy methodology that will perform so much better. Yeah, I love it. So, so some of your points really resonate with me. Like the, the one that you said that really resonates with me the most is we don't need to, right? So often we turn to investors first and we think that's how we've got to fund our business. But if we can find another way, we can kind of become masters of our own destiny. We're not, we're not dependent upon somebody else telling us whether or not we can survive as an entity and have the funding we need. How do we scale our business without taking that money from investors? So the, the first thing I think people need to go to um, especially in mid to higher ticket. First thing is raising prices, just raising prices. Um, but if, for example, let's just say it's a more of a startup, they don't have um, a lot of customers. They're just looking to get their first initial customers out the gate, you know, right away, um, or just get an influx outside of raising prices. Um, what I think it works best is if, if there's two options. One, if the company or business or affiliate has leads being generated, something that I found the vast, vast majority of entrepreneurs, pretty large companies, you'd be surprised, and other people don't do is follow up or follow up enough or in the, the variety of ways they should. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, I've in consultant work, I've talked with companies that are doing a few hundred thousand to a few million a year, and you, you know, in the conversation call with them to see what they have going on. A lot of times they report to me, Oh, I, I email my list or, you know, we have someone on our team who emails our list, our email list, for example, um, once a month. And when I hear that, I have a heart attack because once a month means basically none. So follow up, the, the reason for follow up is to build an actual relationship with your community that you're building. And when you don't follow up, when you don't produce content, when you aren't actually communicating with them, your list, your audience, your followers are all dying. 
Um, literally, they, they will no longer follow you because of competition, because of um, all the distractions in the world. There's so much going on. I'm sure you've noticed things going on in the world. There's a lot of distractions in many different areas uh, we won't get into. So I think that what companies lack, if they have leads being generated, the biggest thing most companies, businesses, entrepreneurs, affiliates lack is the amount of follow-up. So whether it's uh, on their email database, whether they're only emailing once a week or once a month, every day or every other day is necessary. Otherwise, your competition is emailing once a day. Otherwise, your competition, this is the second part of follow-up, is you don't want to follow up just consistently on a regular basis and every day, but also from a variety of sources. So what makes companies produce way more revenue and become even more profitable if they're looking to scale is also following up not just through email, but also through text, through calling, through content production, um, through other sources. Because again, think about if you're a consumer who's interested in an example for dog toys. Now someone's looking at, you know, I want to buy dog toys. Who am I going to buy from? The company that texts me, calls me, emails me, um, and follows up with me in 10 different ways. Or the one, one company that emails me once a month. Now, in some cases, people think it's spam. You know, I'm following up in too many different ways from too many different sources. And then the reality is it's not because, like I said earlier, of that competition, because of so many distractions. If you're following up from five different sources, you're only going to see one or two of them, most likely. So following up more in multiple different sources, and this is also something that separates the well-performing companies from the okay ones, also from different perspectives. And this is what a lot of people don't talk about. So following up consistently way more often um, from a variety of sources called omnipresent marketing, but also from a variety of perspectives. This is something that I start nerding out about and I really like. Um, so oftentimes, you know, most companies and businesses have a single sales page, for example, you know, like click funnels or um, this thing of companies off the top of my head, Frank Kern or whoever have a single dedicated sales page, right? You know, they keep sending you to that same sales page, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. What works way better, exponentially better is following up from multiple perspectives. So not just the normal, let's just say you have a sales page, make a page, a sales page dedicated just to the story behind how your company is built. Make another sales, a sales page going just over the testimonials and social proof that you can provide over your business. You want multiple different perspectives to relate to your audience from multiple different ways because on your list, one, people in general have different interests, you know, and different kinds of personalities. Um, and you want to hit each individual's multiple different things they care about the most, storytelling, social proof, stats, figures, uh, more emotional. And you also want to hit each of those kinds of perspectives in your email list and follow up. So that's something that's really important to me that I think does extremely effective that I've, I've helped people a lot with is better follow up. Cause oftentimes a lot of the times consulting with people, they think it's, I just need better. I need more leads. I just need more leads. Or I just need um, my ads to perform better. And a lot of the times they have leads, they have ads that are performing, but their follow up and conversions are happening because they keep saying the same sales page. They keep saying the same messaging once a month, right? Once a month, almost never when they could be doing it on a daily basis or every other day from multiple sources with multiple different perspectives to actually relate and actually build an actual relationship with their audience. The follow-up game is where it's at. Yeah, definitely. Okay. You've talked about increasing prices a lot. And one of the strategies that is taught out there to increase our prices, we often have to increase our value, right? Um, how do we improve that value? How do we improve what we offer so that we can improve our price? Big shout out to Alex Hermosi, uh, who this is where I learned a lot of that from. I don't know if I'm familiar with Alex Hermosi. He just came out with a really, really well-made book um, that taught uh, about this. And again, it's more about the perception of value. So what increases the perception of value so you can increase your prices is not necessarily what's delivered. It, it can be what's delivered. So for example, you can increase the quantity of something. You can increase bonuses. But what increases perception of value or value is the certainty of getting the result that the product or service will deliver and also reducing the risk of getting that product or service. So for example, this is my favorite thing I've talked about in a lot of my YouTube videos and a lot of what I've been teaching and preaching now. Um, say you have two consultants who both are trying to raise the prices. Uh, both charge 3,000 bucks right now. Uh, they're both gonna try to charge $5,000 a month. 
um, consultant A, here's his pitch. His pitch is, hey, um, I do consulting work with my strategies and methods. I will show you how to bring your agency to produce more money um, and get more leads and prospects. And cut. Consultant B. Consultant B's offer is, in the next 20 days or less, I guarantee you, I will generate you more revenue and more profit than what I charge, or I will pay you to be in profit. Do you want to work together? And the way, you know, and then go, you know, right. That offer and that reduction, reduction of risk and increase in certainty is what completely separates different companies from one another. And that's what differentiates the winners in the marketplace. So again, how you going back to what you asked, how you increase your price, is by increasing the the value you provide or the conception of the value. So again, value B, why you said wow, is because the value of option B was way more, way more than the value of option A. In fact, I can guarantee the first consultant could charge $3,000. The second consultant could charge $6,000 double, and he would keep, obtain, uh, keep and obtain more clients because there's a guarantee he will get those results in X amount of days. And if he doesn't, he will actually pay you to be in profit. So it's, it's as Alex Ramosi says, it's dumb to say no to the second person's offer. And that's what, that's how you can raise prices by reducing, reducing the risk and increasing the certainty of X delivered results and so on. You talked about increasing the ROI as the focus of this interview and increasing ROI, ROI has two elements to it. Obviously it's increasing the price and decreasing the cost. What ideas do you have for us of how we can do that other portion of the ROI of, of reducing our costs? Reducing costs, um, definitely split testing, which is commonly told. It's very commonly told people should split test, but no one does it. Like every company of almost every company I've ever talked to, I'm like, do you do split testing? They go, no, you know, or they've only done split testing, for example, on their opt-in page. So something that does and is really effective for decreasing costs across the board and increasing conversions and ROI is doing split tests. So what is a split test? Basically, I'll give a quick analogy. A split test is testing a abnormal variation of a set page checkout cart or opt-in form to see if the abnormal or variant form of that page checkout cart or form will perform better. So for, ex for example, you have an opt-in rate of around 30%. So you're, you're generating leads for your company. As I say, you, someone offers coaching, they're getting, you know, for every um, person who's seen their page out of 130 of them opt in. So I'm that immediately, immediately reduces that cost and immediately increases leads generated and potential customers generated is split testing to get a higher converting opt-in page. So increasing the opt-in page by testing a variant, um, to increase it by, let's say 10%. Let's just say someone is able to run a split test, run more traffic, run more leads to the variant versus the original, and it gets a 10% higher rate of opt-ins. That's 10% more leads to work with, 10% more customers. It should be, you know, over the long run. Then you take a look at- 10% lower cost. Right, 10 and also 10% lower cost. Now associate that, and this is what most companies don't do and should. What if you did that across every part of your advertising? You can do it with ads. Every part of your follow-up, you can split test emails. Most people don't do that. Also because most email providers don't perform that function even. Um, you can split test your checkout cards. You can uh, split test the pages between the opt-in page and the checkout cart. So you might have a sales page, a bridge page, um, split testing your upsells, your downsells. And imagine if across the board, just by 5%, 10%, you could, someone could increase that across every part of their business. You know, at the end of the day, let's just say it took you five months to do that, you know, run enough split tests to do that across the board. That's a most likely going to be a 50 to multiple hundred percent more increase in ROI and decrease in ad spend because every piece of your business is performing better, uh, requires less leads and traffic to go through it and is in increasing ROI. So it's something that very few businesses do and it, it is more difficult. It's a more advanced thing to do. But I think that by off doing split testing, any company, just an optimate increase, a checkout uh, cart conversion increase, uh, 
split testing ads, those things alone drastically decrease ad spend. And also um, any, any expenditures. Also, of course, following up too, following up ex more extensively because following up is free. Emailing your list more is free. Texting your leads, calling your leads takes some time, but it's free. Um, producing more content, for example, free. But those things also produce more revenue and should decrease expenditures because you're getting more conversions. I love it. I like that you brought up ads. I think ad performance and lead quality are, are very important in this ROI equation as well. So, so how do we get more leads from our ads and how do we improve the quality of those leads? So something that's really important for improving quality. And again, you do want more leads, but you want to make sure if you are getting more leads, they're of course, higher quality. So what you want to change and people often think it's like their ads, ads targeting. So working with a lot of people who run Facebook ads, they think, I think my targeting's off. And usually it's not the targeting. It is the messaging. Um, it's the messaging and how you actually communicate to those leads. So for example, it's the, it's the difference between having minnow bait and whale bait. So say in your ad, uh, you are a coach um, and you're offering, you know, I'm going to do X, Y, Z for free, 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 free. You know, every, all of your messaging is free. This is cheap. This is the cheapest, best deal you're going to get. It, it's inclusive to everyone. So the, the type of leads you're going to get is everyone. You're going to get everyone. So what you want to do is change your messaging so it resonates with, and actually you want to exclude the people you don't want and include the people you do. So you want your messaging to resonate with the actual audience, again, you want to work with in that premium audience, almost like as Russell Brunson says, in your dream 100 circumstance, if you had 100 of your best customers possible, what would be the messaging to track those whale clients, those whale best quality customers who will buy with you again and again and again, and who will follow you for years or decades to come? You want your messaging to resonate with those types of people. Um, so one, changing the messaging copywriting to represent not attracting everyone. You don't want to work with everyone. You only want to work with the best clients possible because they will buy and retain for a very long time. Um, so changing messaging, uh, targeting can be used. You know, you, you, if you have the right advanced targeting, you can try to target uh, a certain type of person in the, the broader niche. But again, the messaging itself is going to differentiate who actually buys from this, who actually wants this. So if, if my generic messaging too is, um, I help people get more leads. Every business across the world wants more leads. If my messaging instead is, I'm an agency, for example, is I help, uh, say I'm, I'm in the uh, dental service uh, niche kind of. So I'd, I'd say, I help dental offices doing uh, seven figures a year. I guarantee I will get them more leads, you know, this is just off the top of my head, so it's a little choppy, but differentiating that messaging versus I help everyone get more leads versus I help only dental places who are doing X amount of dollars get more leads. The person who's going to opt into this page and who wants to work with you in this versus the first option, it's a completely different person for the vast majority of the people coming through. And your ideal customer is going to be drawn to it because you are targeting them. You're focusing on them. They're going to believe you're more credible um, and, and you're going to actually attract much more of them of the ideal customer than as if you reached out to the broad audience. Right. And it resonates with them because like you're saying, it's, it's their particular actual interest. Again, like you're saying, exact, you're exactly on point. If I'm, if I'm a dental person and someone's just saying, if there's two, again, two messagings uh, that I'm seeing or two, you know, variations of copywriting. One is I help you get more leads. One is I help seven figure dental offices scale their leads. Well, let's say I'm a seven figure dental office. That's exactly what I need. It, it's more matching, like you're saying, exactly to the audience. And that's again, more of the human touch is personalization and messaging too, is, is really trying to personalize your ads, your follow up, your sales process too, to also match, um, again, those exact clients. Cause the number of leads is only important if it's the number of increasing leads that are in your actual audience you want precisely. Um, so for example, again, um, a consultant or a coach can be getting clients, um, or sorry, leads, they'd be getting leads and these leads are coming through. Um, 
But oftentimes, the majority of the time, people find when they're in a coach, coaching consulting agency is that they get people who can't afford their services. So if in the beginning, again, it's going back to the same, same strategy, in the beginning of your advertising, you structured your messaging in a way and copywriting in a way to get rid of the people who don't have the money, that means while you're getting less leads, you're only getting interested leads. So this also decreased ad cost because think about the, I've, this is another concept I've learned recently. Think about the, the amount of money people waste on bad leads. And this is why messaging is so important because if you're getting 100 leads, but 95% of them aren't buying, it doesn't matter. If I can get 10 leads, but they're all higher quality people who all have the money, if I can convert half of my five versus 3% of your 100, it's not about lead, lead quantity, it's about lead quality 100% of the time. That's why messaging is so important to make sure you keep out the bad people you don't want and keep in and retain only your kind of dream customers and clients. Thank you so much, John, for sharing your stories and insights with us today. To learn more about or connect with John, you can find his website at johnwework.com or get his book, Finally Wealthy. And there's links to each of these sites in the blog post for this episode on our site. You can also get a free copy of my ebook, Passion Marketing, and learn how you can become a top priority of your ideal customers at passionmarketing.com. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode, and I wish you success in increasing your ROI. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.